Hello, welcome to another session of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel and our program, part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, a joint venture of the Digital Pathology Association and PATH presenter. Our case today comes from uh, the realm of gynecologic pathology. It's a 28-year-old woman who has an ovarian mass. Additionally, she's been having some rather uh, unusual for her menstrual irregularities, uh, raising concern. On exam, she's found to have an ovarian mass. It's fairly sizable, uh, about 12 centimeters. Um, and uh, with that information, uh, she is brought to surgery. And uh, the surgeon uh, very wisely submits to us a section of the, uh, or a portion of, the, of the, the tumor so that we can perform a frozen section. Um, here's that uh, tumor. Uh, as we can see, it's a, a mixture of uh, sort of blue areas and less cellular areas maybe a little bit nodular, uh, no uh, diffuse or epithelial structures at low power. Um, here we see a sort of a mixture of patterns, a cellular uh, stromal component perhaps, loose uh, tissue in between, um, more of this uh, highlighted vascular tissue. Um, and uh, looking a little further, we see um, you know these uh, cells are composed of uh, little strands and cords of uh, blue cells uh, with a little bit of, uh, of uh, relationship one to another um, and some intervening loose fibrous tissue and vascular tissue. So this corded pattern raises uh, a differential that includes a wide variety of things from carcinoid tumors to uh, stromal tumors to small cell carcinoma of, uh, of the uh, ovary um, as we look a little further, we note that there's a few cells that maybe look a little bit more eosinophilic. Um, we don't have the classic insular pattern, and although we have some cords, it certainly doesn't look terribly like um, a, uh, a, neuro, excuse me, a neuroendocrine or a carcinoid type tumor. Um, so what do we do with this on frozen section? Well, we've uh, pretty well eliminated the uh, high-grade neoplastic lesions. Um, and we're looking at uh, what appears to be um, a non-epithelial or at least a, a stromal type of uh, neoplasm. Um, and so uh, telling the, the uh, surgeon that it looks to be a sex cord stromal tumor, uh, we don't see features of malignancy uh, on the frozen section. Um, and that should be enough information uh, for him. We, uh, we did see those uh, eosinophilic cells suggesting possible lighting cells. You might say, you know, you, you favor it being a, a Sertoli lighting tumor or something of that sort. Uh, but uh, making a definitive diagnosis, of course, at this stage is a little bit premature. But uh, it raises the question of, of why uh, gynecologic surgeons need a frozen section uh, and so forth. Um, so I think it'd be helpful to consider what the role is for frozen section in GYN tumor surgery. So first of all, I think uh, it's very helpful for the surgeons to understand what category of neoplasm they're dealing with. Is this a common epithelial tumor? Or are we talking about a serous tumor, or a mucinous neoplasm? Or is it a stromal tumor, a sex cord tumor, fibroma, thecoma, or some other uh, variant of that, granulosa cell, et cetera, et cetera? Um, if we suggest, suspect that there's a germ cell neoplasm based on age or marker status or something like that, that communication certainly should come from the, the uh, surgeon as well. Additionally, uh, there are some lesions that we can clearly identify as likely metastatic that can also help to guide the surgeon's further evaluation intraoperatively. And these are very important distinctions. So you don't have to nail the specific diagnosis, but it's very helpful if you can give the surgeon uh, the category of tumor that you're dealing with. Uh, beyond that, uh, classifying a lesion as benign or borderline or benign or malignant uh, or borderline malignant uh, is also very helpful because that also will determine uh, further st staging and uh, kinds of uh, further procedures that may be performed intraoperatively, omentectomy, uh, peritoneal sampling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, additionally, there are times when we need to identify histology that is more likely to respond to adjuvant therapy, uh, as opposed to those where there may not be uh, ideal adjuvant treatment. 
So identifying serous carcinoma, uh, specifically as most likely serous, is very helpful uh, to the surgeons at that, at that point in time. Um, because once they have a sample, they can give adjuvant treatment, then come back, uh, resect residual disease. Uh, that's much easier on the patient than doing a, a massive resection and so forth. Uh, additionally, there are times when the type of hysterectomy may be uh, guided by evaluation of a frozen section, such as of a cervical lesion or uh, grading or typing of tumor, an endometrial tumor that hasn't been able to be sampled previously. Um, uh, sometimes staging depth of invasion in a hysterectomy specimen can guide or determine lymph node sampling in a patient who may be at somewhat higher risk. Uh, but who uh, also may be a higher risk surgical patient, patient and that they might not want to have to be compelled to sample and stage lymph nodes if not uh, uh, into that higher risk category of a deeply invasive tumor. So those in my experience are the reasons why frozen section is brought in. Uh, this is not a great situation to defer the diagnosis to permanence. Um, and so uh, making your best effort to uh, provide information that will help to guide the surgeon in the next steps of the uh, procedure uh, for the good of the patient is uh, very important. Of course, frozen section in GYN tumor is a notoriously difficult area and one where we have recognized uh, some deficiencies. Um, and so you do want to be careful that you don't get out further onto thin ice than, than you need to be and overcall something uh, that may uh, um, lead to more surgery that, uh, than the patient needs. So uh, coming on to permanent sections on this lesion, here's a nice section of the tumor. And again, we see this sort of nodular pattern. Uh, it's got some quite cellular areas. We've got some variable areas as well uh, here, here. Uh, and so we'll take a look at some of these uh, and see what is uh, making up uh, these components. Uh, here, as we look at this category, or this area here, uh, we've got uh, some sort of loose uh, vascular tissue in here and a mixture of cell types, a little bit more rounded cell nuclei, as well as some of these more uh, spindle-shaped cells in the stroma. So there's a little suggestion here uh, that there's sort of a biphasic or a dual population of cells uh, in this lesion, something we'd be thinking of with Sertoli Leydig tumor. Um, looking at these uh, very densely cellular areas, they looked uh, quite uh, stromal. Uh, a lot of uh, sort of uh, granulosa theca type cells almost. But then you see occasional nested areas like this that look a little bit vaguely tubular. Um, and we again start to wonder about a biphasic tumor like Sertoli Leydig tumor. Um, again, uh, in that category, we're not dealing with a well differentiated tumor. Uh, we're looking at a tumor that's uh, relatively. Uh, uh, poorly or intermediate grade uh, type of differentiation because we're not seeing really well-defined um, uh, tubules and uh, lobules in a, a lot of areas. Uh, we can go to another area here um, and we see a little bit of this more uh, loose myxoid tissue here that sometimes is characteristic of uh, um, certain uh, germ cell tumor, or excuse me, certain uh, sex cord stromal tumors. Um, and here we see sort of a follicular pattern, sort of falling apart uh, sort of appearance uh, that you might see with a juvenile granulosa cell tumor, perhaps. Uh, so that also comes into the differential considerations here. Uh, although uh, these cells, uh, most of them do not have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, such as we would expect with that. Sometimes with these tumors, you really have to hunt very hard to make sure that there are not uh, lighting cells uh, hiding around. Now, uh, groups of cells like this might well be lighting cells, just not well differentiated uh, lighting cells. And so uh, this is a situation where it's a, a little challenging to sort of see this uh, biphasic pattern of uh, stromal cells, uh, sort of more epithelioid or rounded cells. Uh, we'll jump up here to one other area um, and show another feature of this tumor. Uh, which in this case uh, is uh, a fair degree of uh, pleomorphism. Uh, we see some rather bizarre nuclei here um, uh, that uh, would raise consideration for 
uh, other types of neoplasms, maybe even germ cell neoplasms, uh, might enter into the differential here. Uh, here we are seeing some nice uh, cells with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm in some of these, as well as a bit of a nested pattern uh, mixed in here. Um, so, uh, and here's another like tubular structure, uh, again with these admixed uh, bizarre cells. Uh, finally, I'll show you one other area here in this neoplasm uh, that I think helps uh, tremendously with this uh, tumor. And it illustrates that uh, an area that ought to be searched very carefully is the periphery often of these nodules and the interstitium. Um, and here, uh, I think we can find um, some nice groups of very nice eosinophilic cells with round nuclei quite different from these other cells. Um, and then here's a few more over here uh, that I think uh, these uh, fit quite nicely for lighting cells. Um, and so uh, I think this is a Sertoli lighting tumor. Uh, it's not a well differentiated type because it's, uh, it's rather ill-defined, these uh, Sertoli cells and tubular uh, nested pattern areas, uh, the pseudofollicular areas, and even those very uh, pleomorphic areas are quite challenging uh, to uh, identify. Um, but with that finding of some areas, even one or two areas like that, that look like good uh, sort of lighting cells, uh, you can uh, begin to feel a little more strongly towards that diagnosis. Now, once you've made that impression, um, you know, you'll want to examine multiple sections and see other areas. Um, and here's another type of area where uh, again, we see this sort of loose myxoid tissue, stranded, corded tissue, biphasic appearance, um, and then occasional cells that look like uh, lighting cells in some of these areas as well. Uh, I don't see them right off here. Um, again, looking along these uh, cords of uh, fibrous tissue sometimes will help you to identify uh, the areas where you've got uh, good identifiable lighting cells. Um, otherwise, you're just kind of in the sex cord stromal category. Uh, and occasionally, you may have to sign out a case as just sex cord stromal tumor NOS or poorly differentiated um, uh, without defining characteristics. Now, sometimes people will ask, uh, does immunohistochemistry help in a situation like this? And of course, uh, the answer is uh, yes, with some reservations. Um, so just to sort of re review a little bit from our previous lecture on uh, sex cord stromal tumors, Sertoli lytic tumors is a, a dual element uh, neoplasm. But because it has variable differentiation, well, moderately, and poorly, uh, it can be particularly difficult to classify, particularly in the moderately and poorly differentiated uh, elements, because uh, the uh, Sertoli and lighting cells will not be really sharply defi defined. Uh, quite frequently, we find a DICER-1 mutation, either germline or sporadic in these cases, and some patients are a part of the uh, DICER-1 uh, syndrome. Staging is very important, and so uh, identifying that you're dealing with a sex cord stromal tumor and allowing the surgeon to further stage is important. Uh, so how are these graded? Well, uh, this is a nice uh, summary from the uh, National Cancer Center uh, uh, data site. Uh, Well-differentiated tumors have Sertoli cells that are, have open uh, tubules, some closed tubules, and fairly abundant lighting cells. There's very little atypia or mitotic activity. Um, the poorly differentiated tumors generally have sheets of sarcomatous type stroma with areas of lobulated sertoliform growth and very sparse lighting cells. Uh, they can be high nuclear grade and also sometimes have the retiform pattern. Things that are in between, uh, again, sertoli cells that are lobulated, um, occasional spicattered, sparse to numerous uh, lighting cells uh, would fit into the moderately differentiated category. So I think our tumor that we're looking at today probably falls into this moderately differentiated category, although our lighting cells are fairly sparse. Um, and even though we have a focal area of uh, high-grade nuclei.
uh, needless to say, there's not a sharp boundary between those uh, areas. Now, as I mentioned, immunohistochemistry can be useful. Um, of course, uh, sex cord stromal tumors in generally will most often be positive with inhibin, uh, sometimes with, most often with calretinin, SF1, FOXL2, uh, sometimes CD56, WT1, and CD99 can all be useful as uh, uh, markers for sex cord stromal tumor. And it's useful, I think, to do more than one of these, uh, probably two or three at the minimum, because not all will mark with all of these uh, different markers. With Sertoli lining tumors, however, you will also get uh, labeling with pancytokeratin and with vimentin uh, in those pancytokeratin positive to, uh, cells, which is a very useful marker. Um, the lining cell component will tend to be negative with uh, WT1, uh, CD99, and FOXL2, but does stain with melanin and MART1. Um, again, these are also uh, uh, sex sort stromal markers in general but very useful for those lighting cell tumors, uh, perhaps uh, just as they are in the adrenal. <clears throat> Some of the sex core tumors uh, will have heterologous in, uh, infl uh, epithelium or other he heterologous elements, which may stain with uh, other uh, tissue-specific markers from the GI tract, uh, AFP, and so forth. Uh, and those can be useful uh, myogenic markers sometimes if you want to highlight those areas. So let's take a look at uh, some of these uh, immunohistochemical markers. Here's our control tissue on the left. We can see that it's staining the colonic mucosa. This is a pancytokeratin stain. And as we look here, we can see there are scattered areas with a rather strong staining, um, such as here, where nearly <clears throat> most of the cells are positive. But even in uh, other areas of the tumor, we get some uh, staining, uh, such as we see here um, in these cells. And it's not uniform every cell, but it's sufficiently uh, positive within this tumor as to suggest that there's some keratin expression uh, in these uh, cells. Uh, this would not be characteristic of granulosa cell tumor. It would not be characteristic of uh, germ cell tumors, uh, of course. Uh, and so those two things can be nicely excluded with this kind of a stain. Um, oh, here's another repeated the same slide. Um, and then here we have a, uh, an inhibin stain, uh, which shows, uh, again, some uh, nice weak, so, oh, no, excuse me, this is a WT1 stain. Um, and so we can see that this is uh, staining these uh, cells. Uh, we could go and look at our um, putative uh, um, lighting cells um, in some of these areas and see that uh, those cells were, were negative. Um, and I didn't uh, highlight the specific areas where I wanted to do that, so I won't be able to show you here. Uh, but this would be a, a differential that is positive in the Sertoli component, negative in the Lydic uh, component. Um, and then here, an inhibin stain showing a more diffuse positivity, and this would be positive in uh, both elements. Um, and you can see that uh, staining here. I apologize for the uh, scanner lines. Uh, sometimes the uh, fields get plowed and uh, uh, portions get uh, overlooked. But you can see nice uh, staining with inhibin B. Excuse me, inhibin alpha. So our final sign out uh, on this case is Sertoli lighting cell tumor, uh, intermediate grade. Um, I have included in the slide deck some additional uh, uh, histologic slides of this lesion as well as some links to uh, digital slides uh, at the CAP site uh, with, for your further study if you'd like to uh, spend more time really pouring over the microscopy of these lesions and cementing in your mind the uh, uh, morphology that you should be looking at or looking for. We thank you for joining us in this program. I hope that was helpful. Uh, we welcome your comments either directly and uh, certainly hope that uh, if you like this that you'll uh, share it with others. Um, and subscribe. Hit that button and subscribe so that you catch uh, future releases uh, on our channel as well. Um, so until next time, thanks so much for joining us.